Computer Science 461 Software Reuse. So let's talk a little bit about reuse based software engineering. So basically a lot of engineering, in fact almost all of it, they don't build things from scratch. They reuse and modify existing components. For example, General Motors or Ford don't reinvent the internal combustion engine each new model year. They use a variation on what they already have. Now, occasionally they do have larger redesign efforts. Most of the time, uh, what you get between a 2015-2016 automobile is a slight modification between those model years and for different products in the same vehicle line. You'll modify the base engine. So, in software we can take a similar idea. And you can have reuse that takes place at several different levels application system reuse, which is the whole application systems can be reused by either incorporating it without change into other system, that's a component off the shelves, software um, reuse, or by developing application families, which we'll talk about a little later. You can do component reuse, where you have individual components of an application from a subsystem uh, to individual single objects that can be reused and we'll cover that in chapter 17. And then object and function reuse where we're using just individual objects or individual functions from uh, other code that we've written. So why is this good? Well, it increases the dependability because these are things that have already been tested and tried and true. It reduces uh, process risk because you know that you've already got that component developed. Uh, it provides effective use of specialists you have standard compliance, especially for the user interface, and accelerated development. Now there are some uh, downsides. One is increased maintenance costs, especially if you don't have the source code. Old component versions can no longer, might no longer be supported, so you might have to upgrade the uh, individual components. And also have a lack of tool support. Uh, for example, case tools may not support uh, the component-based uh, software engineering process. Uh, you can also get into something called the not invented here syndrome where the development is still considered more important than the maintenance or reuse and the uh, developers are uh, reticent to accept these components because they didn't develop them. Also creating and maintaining a component library is pretty expensive and uh, techniques for classifying and cataloging all these are still in the development stages. Locating, understanding, and adapting reusable components is uh, also quite a bit of a challenge. So there are some downsides. So what does the reuse uh, landscape look like? This is um, a figure on page 429 in the ninth edition of the uh, textbook, and it shows all the different types of reuse that uh, can go on. And so there are different ways of achieving reuse, from design patterns to program libraries to application product lines. What do all these terms mean? Let's take a look at them one by one. So design patterns are solutions to software design problems you find again and again in the real world of application development. These uh, patterns are about reusable designs and intera interactions of objects. Uh, Gamma wrote the book on this uh, along with some other authors. It's now about 20 years old, but it's uh, still quite applicable. Component-based uh, software development, the systems are developed by integrating components or a collection of objects that conform to component model standards. Next one, application frameworks. These are collections of abstract or concrete classes that can be adapted and extended to create application systems. Legacy system wrapping. Uh, you can see this in chapter 10 when we talked about legacy systems. Basically, you can take an old legacy system and wrap it in a prettier interface. A lot of times that means putting a web front end on it um, and providing access to the legacy system in that way. Uh, Service-oriented systems. Systems are developed by linking shared services that may be externally provided. Uh, it's a great idea, but it just hasn't been fully realized yet, where you can have these external software as a service that you can uh, link to, and uh, the external component will provide that service. We're getting there, but that one still hasn't quite gotten totally accepted yet. Application product lines. Here's an application where you have a common architecture and it can be adapted in different ways for different customers. Uh, something like Sakai would probably fall into an application product line. Uh, PeopleSoft certainly does. And then component off the shelf integration where you have uh, systems that are developed by integrating existing application systems. Configurable vertical applications, basically a generic system is designed so it can be configured to the needs of specific customers 
pretty close to application product line. There's some minor semantic differences there. Uh, program libraries, class and function libraries, uh, implementing commonly used abstractions that are available for reuse. Uh, a lot of us do this. Uh, program generators. Uh, generator system embeds knowledge about particular types of applications and can generate systems or system fragments in that domain. Aspect-oriented software development where you have shared components that are woven into an application at different places when the program is compiled. And ERP, which are enterprise resource planning systems, these are large-scale systems that encapsulate generic uh, business functionality and rules that are configured for an organization, things like uh, SAP and BA systems. So which techniques do you use? There's a, quite a cornucopia of them that we looked at in the past few slides. Several factors to consider. One is development schedule for development. Uh, how long you expect the software to last? Background skills and experience of your development team. If you haven't had experience with this, it's going to be difficult. Criticality of the software and its non-functional requirements and the application domain. Uh, take a closer look at design patterns. And again, design patterns are a way of reusing abstract knowledge about a problem and solution. So the pattern is a description of the problem and the essence of its solution. Solution, solution may be reused in different settings. Should be sufficiently abstract to be reused in different settings. Patterns often rely on object characteristics such as inheritance and polymorphism. Four elements to them. One name, which is meaningful pattern identifier, um, problem description, what it says on the tin, where this is actually applicable, this design pattern. Uh, solution description. Now this is not a concrete design, but a template for a design solution that can be instantiated in a number of different ways. Um, and consequences, results and trade-offs of applying the pattern. Uh, downside to design patterns is that it often requires experienced developers who know about design patterns and how to apply them. So, in the words of Jimi Hendrix, you should be experienced. Uh, Generator-based reuse. This is another type of concept reuse. Uh, for example, standard algorithms and patterns, and these are embedded in a generator and parameterized by user commands. The program is then automatically generated. Uh, this is um, used in business applications such as data processing systems, also for parser generators for language processing, for exam example, Yak or Java CC, code generators for case tools, and command and control systems. It also takes advantage of something called separation of concerns, which is something you should be familiar with from uh, CS150. Basically, a function returns value. A function does one thing, and it does it well. It doesn't do a multitude of different things. Uh, each unit of software should only do one thing and one thing only, and do it well. Now, this doesn't always happen, but uh, it's a good idea to try to do it anyway. So what are the uh, downsides um, to generator-based reuse? Well, the same old downsides as before. For example, technology doesn't really perform as well as it should or as it's advertised to do. High initial cost, um, developer training for it, uh, but then you do get cost uh, effective application development. Application frameworks. Uh, basically, a framework is a subsystem design made up of a collection of abstract and concrete classes and the interfaces between them, uh, or a generic structure that can be extended to create a more specific subsystem or application. Object-oriented advocates like to say that objects support reuse, but they're often at too fine-grained a level. So frameworks take a look at this from a higher level. They're generic and they're extended to create more specific application or subsystem. Extending the framework typically involves adding concrete classes that inherit operations from abstract classes in the framework, adding methods that are called in response to events that are recognized by the framework. Uh, the problem with framework is their complexity, which means it takes a long time to actually use them effectively and also developer training. So there are three classes of these. One, system infrastructure frameworks that support the development of system infrastructure such as communications, user interfaces, and compilers. Middleware, things like Corba, Com, and Enterprise Java Beans. And these are standards and classes that support com component communication and information exchange between these components. And then Enterprise Application Frameworks, these support the development of specific types of applications such as telecommunication or financial systems. Again, this is a pretty high level. You may want to look at, at the Model Viewer Controller Framework for 
an example of this with object oriented design. And last, um, this application system reuse where you're using reusing the entire application system. So it can involve uh, reusing the entire application system uh, basically by configuring them to a specific environment or integrating two or more systems to create a brand new application. So in this section we'll talk about COTS and product lines. COTS is commercial off-the-shelf uh, products that can be used without changes by the buyer. Uh, some types of COTS products have been around for a lot of years, uh, for example database system. And building a large system by integrating COTS is now a viable development strategy for some types of systems. Uh, you usually get faster application development and usually lower development costs. E-commerce systems are typically full of uh, um, COTS or commercial or com uh, off-the-shelf uh, components. So. Some of the uh, design decisions, uh, which COTS products offer the most appropriate functionality, how will the data be exchanged? Be careful uh, here, different products have different standards for exchanging data. Uh, what features of the product will actually be reused? And apparently I didn't print the last slide, so we'll go through them anyway. Uh, problems with COTS, uh, requirements usually have to be adapted to fit the COTS components. They're based on assumptions that are impossible to change. In other words, you adapt, not the um, not the commercial off-the-shelf uh, software. Choosing the right one is difficult. Um, many of these are not well documented and there's often a lack of local expertise and support for the um, off-the-shelf components. And the vendor still controls the COT product to a large extent. So software product lines, these are a set of applications with common application specific architecture. In essence, you have a base product and then you specialize it to meet the client's needs. This is a hot research area in software engineering and it's kind of the latest uh, silver bullet. So you can have uh, these um, you can have these software product lines that are platform specialization, basically different versions of the application are developed for different platforms, um, environment uh, specialization, different Operating systems, you know, one could handle Android, <clears throat> one could handle Windows Phone, uh, or different types of communication equipment. Function specialization created for cu customers with different uh, requirements one for a university to do payroll, one for a private uh, business to do payroll. And then process created to support different business processes. For example, if there were you're selling something to the University of Hawaii system, uh, UH Hilo and UH Manoa may have different process um, for doing business uh, with their business offices so you can modify it so that it worked uh, with both and specialized in the process. Uh, software product lines are generally designed to be reconfigured. You can do this either at deployment when you have the generic system, it's designed for configuration by the customer and you bring in consultants who work with the customer to figure configure it for their exact uh, needs. Things like uh, SAP, PeopleSoft all do this uh, deployment time. Uh, design time, modify a product line by developing or selecting components that go into the new system for the customer and then you have it designed when it gets uh, sent to the customer site. Uh, these are part of enterprise resource planning systems and this is another big area. If you walk through a major airport uh, you know, outside of uh, Honolulu, you'll just see advertisement after advertisement for companies like BEA and SAP that do that. Sometimes you'll see PeopleSoft as well. Basically, these are large-scale integrated systems designed to support business processing such as ordering, scheduling, invoicing, and inventory management. You get to have it somewhat customized, usually at deployment time, but you still have to adapt your business process to it quite a bit, unless you have very deep pockets. Uh, so next time we'll take a look at component-based software engineering.